I am a human, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. But what if? What if there are so many more mechanics going on at play here with the universe that when these terms were applied to these markers of what we now deem to be time, that there was a creation of time that took place there. And by our collective agreement to mark these markers as time, that we created something entirely. Because to me, the only constant before that was the rising and setting of the sun. That happened. Or did it? Daniel, welcome to Shifting Dimensions. I'm so excited to speak with you. How are you? I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to see if there are any shifts. In... <laughs> so I, I, this is the beginning, right? We're recording right now? Yeah, yeah, this but is the beginning. I guess we're just having a little bit of fun because we were just laughing and getting giddy. So <laughs> I'm going to try to settle into not shifting and being <laughs> steady and grounded. I, I'm excited to see where this conversation goes today. Yeah, me too. Honestly, we're here to have fun. So we don't have to take it so seriously. But I wanted to start off with a quote that I actually pulled up from your website. And this was just talking about your journey as a person and then eventually into past life regression. But it's just a synopsis or, or a quick um, snapshot. And you said, as a child, I had always believed there was more to the world than what met the eye. But the education system taught me that this wasn't the case. Science held the answers to everything, and if science couldn't answer a mystery, then there was no merit to it. So I grew up a child of science, believing only in scientifically accepted theories. And when I came across that excerpt, when I was reading about you, I was like, oh my God, that's like most people in this world, right? Like we need hard evidence to actually believe something is true. So how did you go from kind of having this ideology or being programmed to feel like science was the true way to eventually becoming um, a past life regressor. The most important distinction I probably should make right now is that I still don't know. That's, that's the truth. So I, while I have shifted from my rigidness in a couple ways, I guess kind of with, with the, with the name of the podcast is shit. Okay. So, okay, I'm, I'm gonna be serious now. I love the puns. Trust me. One of the most valuable lessons I've ever been taught was taught to me by my astrology teacher. His name is Jim Share. He taught me the difference between believing and knowing. And I do my very best to differentiate whether or not it is a belief or a fact. And I just clung on to facts. That's just what I did. So what really became the catalyst for me was when I was in my early 20s, I came down with an autoimmune disorder. And throughout my 20s, it was just, it wasn't fun. I'll put it that way. And I had a firm belief in Western medicine. And, oh, yeah, this doctor's going to fix me. If I go to this doctor, they're going to fix me because that's what they were telling me. And it just didn't happen. So I had to open myself up to exploring alternative treatments, which was difficult for me to do because there was no proof. But I think when you're pushed to do something, you can either stand in one place or you can make a change and shift. I'm going to be doing that a lot yeah. today, probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love that. So, so your autoimmune disorder, I guess, was the catalyst for you to start exploring alternative ways of healing and how did you stumble upon past life regression well while the autoimmune disorder opened up the door what another huge catalyst for me was my stepmother passing away when i was 28 and well time is important to me that was almost 28 not that anyone okay <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to believe that she was in a better place a couple months after she passed away. I just, I really wanted to believe. And when she was in the hospital, her, or her sister had brought up this book. It was called, was it Heaven, Heaven is for Real, I believe. It was about a child having a near-death experience. And at the time, I just rolled my eyes in, in my head because I wasn't going to just do that in the hallway at the hospital. Yeah, you know, okay, sure, whatever. But a few months later, I found myself in that place of wanting to believe. 
I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go read that book. I went to Amazon, looked for the book, read the description. I just can't do it. I can't do it. But right below it was a book called Proof of Happy. And that was written by a neurosurgeon. And I'm like, okay, I can get a little more on board with that because after reading his biography in the, the section of the description of the book, I said to myself, this person pretty much has everything to lose and not much to gain. So they must have been very moved by the experience that they had. So I read the book and I started to get more on board with these things. And I just kind of allowed myself to let moments come into my life to show me that there may be more to the world than what meets the eye. And past life regression just happened to fall into my lap. And I had to really sit on it for a little while. But then I gave it a try and it just, it was that wow moment of wow, that just felt very real to me. And I walked away from my first session. I, I looked at the world differently when I walked out of it. But the thing was, I didn't know that my experience was real, but I believe that it was real. And while I believe that past life regression can do many amazing things, you know, I believe that it has the potential to heal you in one way or another. I did not walk away healed from my first session. I walked away with something that was so much more valuable, which was just that shift in perspective. Really, no pun intended there. I walked away a firm believer in past lives. So I said to myself, I believe in past lives. Now, by default, I believe in future lives. Next time, it could be better or it could be worse. These are the cards I've been dealt this time. So how am I going to play them? So that's where that shift in perspective happened. And... I just allowed myself to believe a lot more than I previously did and that I didn't necessarily need to have proof, but belief was enough. But I was never going to say, oh, I have proof unless I did. And I didn't. So I think that was the safe middle ground and probably the responsible middle ground as well. It's interesting what you're talking about with the fact that science gives us evidence, right? So we can kind of know for sure that this most likely is true. And part of the reason why I was so interested in past life regression, I thought it was like the closest way to kind of get evidence into some of these like metaphysical concepts, right? Where like you're having multiple people or thousands of people regressing while well, speaking for speaking on the work of Dolores Cannon, right? Having all these people regress and then she's picking up patterns of the same things that they're saying. Um, people that don't know each other and she's you know writing books I think she has a couple of books called the convoluted universe um, mm -hmm. I, I got into five yeah books one through five and it, so to me I was like okay well this is kind of like her collecting data and information um, from all these thousands of people that she's regressed and like there are patterns that are showing up that kind of give evidence to some of these concepts related to past lives and reincarnation and aliens, et cetera. Did you find that for you as well? Like, I think it's hard to say, I know for sure. Like you're saying that it's more of a belief system for you, but in, in doing your work as a past life regressor, did you look at this as evidence as well outside of just a belief system? Do you mind if I ask you a question first? Yes, go ahead. So everything you just said, while I, I'm on board with it, my question is, what does that prove? I think for me, it proves that the world, the universe, how we think it works is so much bigger than what we can actually conceptualize. And also that reincarnation, there's a high chance that reincarnation is actually a, a real thing. Okay, can we have some fun with this right now? I, yes. <laughs> you're, you're cool. I like you. <laughs> yes, let's have some fun. How is that the conclusion you came to based off of all of these people recounting their experience and a lot of them having similar experiences? So that's a great question, right? Because sometimes I, I don't know if it's kind of like, uh, what's that word when you believe something to be true. So you have a bias towards the information like that a confirmation bias. Yes. So I, so some, that's a great question, right? Cause sometimes I'm like, is it just confirmation bias? Cause when I was younger, I, 
just felt to me it was just obvious that the way people view religion and I'm talking five or six right I just remember thinking the way people view religion in the world just there was like so much information missing there was something missing I thought there's so much more to this I just couldn't put my finger on it so growing up and, and coming across concepts like reincarnation etc that just seemed true to me like it just felt like a knowing right so coming across um Dolores Cannon's work and just doing research myself I'm like I think this is this seems I, I think I'm correct in believing this even with near-death experiences I listen to so many near-death experiences as well that talk about those things so I'm always looking for threads across different like topics and even religion right like in Hinduism they do believe in reincarnation etc so I'm always looking for threads and I'm like all of this kind of makes sense right um mm -hmm. But I guess there's no concrete evidence, right? There's no picture that we can show of someone dying, going to wherever they need to go to, if that's heaven, and then coming back in a different avatar or body. Like we cannot show that in in data. We're just taking people's accounts from these past life regressions or near-death experiences. So there's no hard data outside of what people are saying while they're in their session or being like, you know, being regressed, there's no hard data or like pictures or images to kind of show for, for, for real that this is actually something that exists. So let's say I have a regression. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll put me in the, in the passenger seat for this one. And someone regresses me and I go back to, let's say Lincoln, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. in the early 1900s. And when I'm there, I see my house in that life. And I see the address as 1234 Wichita Street. So then when I come back with that information, I go and do the research. I type it in. 1234, was it Wichita, right? Wichita Street? Yeah. Oh, my God. That's the house that I saw. Mm. Oh my God. It was real. Does that prove that the experience was my life? That's a great question. Because this is also something I was going to ask you. Because some people, I, I've heard that many people have been regressed and they all feel like at some point they were, they lived as this like well-known person in history, like Cleopatra, for example. So many people have like regressed and been like, oh, I was Cleopatra or something. So to, to your to your question is, how do we know that that was really your experience? I don't, I don't think we can ever figure that out, to be quite honest. I want to ask you that question, though. What what do you think it? Oh, I'm proves? having so much fun right now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Like the wheels are turning. How would you answer the questions you asked me, like from your work and taking all these people back into their past lives? What do you think, what does that prove to you? I feel pretty much the same way that you do with regards to, it may not prove concretely that this was my life, but it sure seems like there's something more to it because man, Mm. Would that be one hell of a coincidence yeah. if I was able to see that exact house, get the right address, something that I've never seen before, because I've never been in Nebraska, at least in this life I haven't. Mm -hmm. What that may not even prove necessarily to me, but a strong indication of is that there is something more at play here. Yeah. And to me, that's a that's enough. So in a book, something like that is really cool. It's really cool to see, oh my God, they were able to extract that information. And, oh my God, and they found it. That's awesome. I don't really focus on that stuff during sessions though. Sometimes, yeah, we may get a detail here and there if it's just there. But do we want to use that type of work for cerebral excitement or to actually learn something about ourselves mm -hmm. and actually work on ourselves a bit? Because what if the real magic, per se, was what happened inside of that house? It was about the interactions that took place inside of that house. So 
I could go back to my friends after and be like, yeah, I lived at one, two, three, four Wichita street. But how is that really going to change my life at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what get or gets lost in a lot of this is what moves the needle forward? How do we evolve as a species, as a civilization, as a society? I think it's about what we do on ourselves or what, what we do on the inside. How do we work on ourselves on the inside? So I think all that stuff is really cool. And I mean, I'm deeply fascinated by it. And sure, we can talk convoluted universe and, and all those concepts because, yeah, it's, it's fun. Mm -hmm. But to me, that is all those shared experiences is 99.9% .9 proof that there's just something more at play here. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's interesting to hear you talk about this because it sounds like, and let me know if I'm wrong. It Bad sounds like business. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> no. I think it's great for business actually because I think yeah, it's really fun to talk about the potential of like past lives and the different lives that you've had. But I think what's important in what I'm hearing you say is that there needs to be an integration of that knowledge into this life, right? Like if you are going back to your past life and you are seeing yourself interact in certain ways, what does that mean for your evolution as a being or as a person? Like what are, how can we make this more practical in your life? Is, does that, is that what you're trying to get at with, mm -hmm. with your perspective? Well, look, there are many different possibilities from that life that I saw mm -hmm. on 1234 Wichita Street. I forgot, where, where was it in Nebraska? Which city did we say? I don't think we picked the city. We didn't? Okay. We don't need to. That would just be a waste <laughs> of time. <laughs> so it's somewhere. Well, no, we probably should say o Omaha or Lincoln. Okay. One of the, uh, L Omaha. comes first. Omaha. Yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll go Omaha. Yeah. You know, we don't want to go with what you should do. Uh, so what if it's about something tangible happening to me in this life? And it just so happens that whoever that man was, because I, I probably saw myself as a man because for this story's sake, it just works better. Mm -hmm. But that man was back in the early 1900s in Omaha, Nebraska on 1234 Wichita Street that the collective consciousness or the universe or God, whatever this great big grand thing may be, just knew that that was the most tangible story for me to understand and draw a parallel for what's going on in my life, what was going on behind those doors. So, or so I could walk away and say, oh, it's easier for me to look at someone else's life and understand what's going on there than to look at my own. But, oh, because I was able to look at that one, I can now make changes in mine because it's a little less uncomfortable to look at theirs instead of mine. But that was the segue for me to start looking at mine. So I'm yeah. just drawing upon someone else's life i mean i'm a firm believer in in duality but that doesn't mean i don't believe in non-duality you know that we can be separate but one all at the same time so what if i'm just drawing from another part of me so that's that's what i think when it comes to anything we may encounter in a regression and at the end of the day this is what i also tell everyone i don't care if it was real what you saw i care what you do with it mm. i care if it helps make you a better person because it's up to you what you choose to do with the information. That's yeah. that's it. Like you get to choose. That's the beauty of this process. You can do everything with it or you can do nothing with it. Yeah. You can go ahead and talk to your friends about 1234 Wichita Street in Omaha, Nebraska. Or you can talk about, man, he was a bit of a jerk. That guy, yeah. he had a really good heart, but he was a bit of a jerk. And you know what? I think I see a little bit of myself in him. Mm. And he wasn't spending enough time with his kids. I think I need to spend a little more time with my kids. So what do you decide to take away from that experience? By the way, I'm not married. I don't have kids. This is not one of my past lives that I'm drawing from. It just seemed like middle America, very middle of the road, <laughs> a generic life. That, you know, yeah, that exactly. Like, you know, <laughs> the standard. Going on. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The standard. Um, it's so interesting that you say that though, because today I was, thinking about something like I always random thoughts always like pop up in my mind right and this whole notion of uh singularity and you know a lot of people will say like I'm you and you're me and we're all kind of like the same but we're all having like different experiences um 
in order to learn from different vantage points. So I think that kind of, it sounds similar to what you were just talking about, but especially to the piece about, you know, if, if you are regressed into this, into a past life, it could be yours. It could be someone else's experience that you're experiencing in order for you to implement certain things into your current life reminds me of like a lot of what Akashic records readers do. I don't, I am sure you're probably familiar with Akashic records readings, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um, what they do is that they obviously highlight people's lives, especially lives that are affecting them in their current life so that they can work through certain patterns that they've experienced lifetime from lifetime to lifetime so that they can move through their karma. So I'm asking this question to, I guess, ask you, is that also like part of your work? Is is that kind of built in, like moving through karmic cycles? Do you talk about that at all with your clients? This is one of those times I'm going I'm to need to ask you, what do you feel a karmic cycle is? Okay. So from my understanding of what a karmic cycle is, because karma, people usually think of it as, you know, what you do onto others comes back to you, but it's, I guess it's not that simple because karma can be brought over from different lifetimes. So the way I understand it is if you and I were friends in a previous lifetime and I betrayed you, right. And you were really hurt by that. We reincarnate into this life again let's say we decide to be friends, but this time you're the person betraying me and I'm the friend being betrayed. So now I'm experiencing what I put you through, right? So it's kind of like that karmic cycle. So in this life, I can decide to learn from that experience so that I don't repeat it in another life, or I can decide to just continue like recycling that cycle. That's my understanding of it is that what you understand or do you have a different take? I think that's a part of it. What I typically see is people playing out the same roles. Mm. That if you betrayed someone in another life, that you may be in that same position in this life to either do it again or to make the choice not to do it. Because it's also about the other person oh. and the choices that they decide to make. How are they going to respond to being betrayed? Are they going to go off and massacre a little village? Or are they going to move on with their life and do something to let go of that hurt and pain and do something positive with it? Now, the question becomes, is there a universal standard of morality and what is positive and what is not exactly. positive? But that's what I tend to see is it's usually about being in the same position. That doesn't mean I haven't seen it on the other side of, oh, that person killed me or, you know, did this horrible thing to me in this life. And, and oh, oh, my God, but I did that to them. I do see that from time to time. But generally, it's about, again, this is just what I see. As a practitioner, that's it. I'm one practitioner out of thousands. Mm -hmm. So their experience could be completely different from mine. And they may be seeing it all of like, oh, you were the perpetrator before. Now you're going to be the victim. That could be what it is. So every, that's my way of saying just because I'm a past life regressionist, just take this as information that I'm presenting from my experience. It's not, and it's not fact. Mm -hmm. It's observation. That's it. You know, so when it comes, that's why I asked you that question of well, what do you feel a karmic cycle is? Because we could have completely different views on what that means. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think language gets lost in a lot of all this. Like, let's talk about the word smart for a second. What do you think smart means when you hear the word smart? I, I genuinely think smart is subjective, but I, I do think that there are a thousand ways to be smart. I don't, I think it's about finding when I'm talking to someone, I just, what comes out to me is their strengths. Like, where they're smart. I don't like to use like a blanket statement for what smart is. I think everyone is smart. I know that sounds so like, oh, you know, great. That's a great response. But I genuinely think everyone's smart, but in their own specific way. What about you? So you're equating smart right now to intelligence with the word smart. Mm. Oh, do you separate those two words? Well, that's what I think when I think smart. Oh. But what else does smart mean? 
I, I feel like smart and intelligence intelligence are like interchangeable, no? So what it when you're describing a smart look, mm -hmm. what are you describing? Oh, to me, a smart look is something that is like someone who's dressed, they're well put together. They don't have any stains on their clothes. It's ironed. They look clean and sophisticated. That's a smart look to me. So it has nothing to do with intelligence. No. <laughs> so see what I mean there? Yeah. How using yeah. that one word can have completely different meanings. And I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. I get it. To me, this is a karmic cycle that I'm playing out right now mm -hmm. where there's not really many other people at play. It's I have a microphone and there's an audience listening to this. And I'm coming on here and saying, you can listen to what I'm saying, but don't take it as gospel. Don't take it as the end all be all. Mm -hmm. Take with it and make your own choice what you want to do with it. Because to me, that is part of my karmic cycle of having a platform and not using it responsibly. Interesting. So it's, you see, like, it may not even be about any others. It's just how am I going to be in this position right now? Or I could mm -hmm. come on today, be like, this is the way it is. Listen to me, people. I'm the past life regressionist here. That's what my handle is on Instagram. You think they just give that to anyone? No, you need to listen to me. The past life regressionist. I know what I'm talking about, past life regression. Now, yeah. that may be me repeating my own personal karmic cycles again with no one else at play there. Or maybe everyone tuning into the audience right now, or all of your audience, may have been there in the crowd with me abusing my platform in other lives. Mm -hmm. So maybe they are playing it out in the same way. And then I have that choice whether or not I'm going to do it the same way or I'm going to be like, you know what? It's time to do things differently. Oh, so that's, that's good. You know, it's. And I think that's why it's so important to, to clarify in these situations. Like, what do you mean? Like that, not even like in a, yeah, you know, not even in a condescending way, but it's, it's important to ask someone for the clarification of what is, what is it that you mean when you say that? Right. So that we're on the same page. That mm -hmm. is, that was such a great example. And, um, and I've had several conversations about karma before in the past and, one thing I realized, and even with the example that you gave, karma a lot of times is very personal. So it's not really about the other person who hurt you or didn't hurt you or whatever. It's really, it's very personal because it boils down to your actions. Like you said, if I betray someone, is that person going to, they can decide, they can choose to murder a small village or choose to forgive and let go and and move forward and I guess that would kind of break the karmic cycle because it was their personal decision it was more about how they were reacting to what was being done to them and the audience listening to you right you're saying that you're working through this karmic cycle about using your platform responsibly I guess the audience can decide for themselves do they want to take your word as law or decide for themselves if what you're saying is true for them is that what you're trying to explain Exactly. Yeah. Because really what it boils down to is I was an irresponsible teacher. Mm. And if anyone is listening, even though I don't call myself a teacher per se or pitch myself that way, if I'm going out here and talking about these concepts or belief systems, there is a level of education that's coming along with talking about it. So Absolutely. I better handle this very responsibly. So that's... Yeah. That's how past life regression has helped me in that respect. I mean, I myself have had many regressions, but this is one of those reoccurring themes that comes up for me is using my platform responsibly. So that's what I wanted to take away from that. Sure, mm -hmm. the vanity component of it was really cool, but how do I want to apply that in this life? Yeah. And this is how I want to do it. I want to do it responsibly. And here's what becomes hard, though. We live in a world that is, I mean, let's even just talk about this spiritual nook right here. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a really cool title. Past Life Regressionist comes on to talk about responsible or responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> the cool title would be Past Life Regressionist comes to talk about ETs and parallel reality. 
that's the thing that's going to draw the clicks. Mm. Now we look, it's up to you what you decide to title the episode. I'm totally cool with it because this is your platform. It's your choice. But what's what's the responsible thing for me to do? If you ask me a direct question about that, yeah, I'm, I'm going to answer it. But am I on to, you know, like, hey, everyone, this is cool. 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 Click, 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 click. Come over to my page. By the way, my podcast is called Timeless Spirituality if you want to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> I love the plug. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only human. I'm not perfect. I still got some learning to do. But do you know what I mean of how how do I navigate in this life as Daniel? as someone with a platform in a society that that craves flash and that that just wants to consume things that are easily consumable and yeah. things that don't really need to make you think deeply on that deep level on the emotional level as opposed to the cerebral level because that's very fun and, yes. you know, like that's, those are the choices that we make. I it had gets this, the people going. Yeah. I had this amazing opportunity to come on this platform today. Uh, got an invitation. Now it's up to me how I choose to utilize that invitation. Yeah. Oh my God. You're literally speaking to my soul right now because I, that's one of the things I try to do on this platform. You know, I, I want to have engaging, interesting, fun, dynamic conversations, but I also want people to think for themselves and think outside of the box. I, I don't think a lot of people think outside of the box a lot of times. So this is part of the purpose of the show. And to your point, you know, like in doing the podcast, I also have another podcast called The Word to the Wise. And there we kind of talk about awesome mind, title. body, spirit. Thank you. Um, so I've, I've heard people say in the past, like, why don't you have more shocking titles? Why don't you, you know, title it this way? I always have two responses to that. One, um, I don't, I'm not in the business of like shocking people or like scaring people to click on stuff. And two, I don't like false advertisement because sometimes people will say like, oh, this is what we're going to talk about. And then you click into the podcast and listen to like 30 minutes to an hour and the topic that's titled is not even addressed at all. Right. So I don't believe in that. I'm people can do whatever they want to do. I'm not necessarily judging, but I do think that there's a <laughs> Sorry. <Okay. laughs> Sorry for jumping in. I think that there's an enormous responsibility on people who, you know, have a platform to actually use it as as ethical as possible. And we do live in a world right now where it's really driven by sensationalism and clicks. I mean, if your story is jarring and you're sharing it and you title it and the title is jarring and that's your truth, absolutely. But it's like the the false advertisement or trying to pander that I think it could be very problematic. So I really appreciate mm -hmm. you for like bringing that up, especially, you know, I, I don't know if you watched a documentary on Netflix that was talking about twin flames. I roll my eyes every single time I see someone talk about twin flames not to say that it's not true I don't know but personally what I've heard I've come to the conclusion that 90% of it is bs right and um a lot of people live and die by that whole concept and that's their prerogative maybe I'm missing something but I, I do think it's very harmful personally and the way people talk about it, it's like, this is the truth. This is the truth of reality. This is the truth of relationships and and especially romantic relationships. So again, I'm just using that as an example of people not being responsible with their platform or potentially using it to um, take advantage of people. You mean my girlfriend is not my other half twin flame? We We weren't brought together to raise the consciousness of earth in order to ascend it to the 27th dimension is that what you're telling me right now 
I, I hate to break the news to you. If you believe she is, then, you know, by all means. But I personally, I just think it's problematic. It just sounds like a, a lot of those relationships that they talk about and the way twin flames are described, it just sounds like a standard karmic relationships that people potentially have the ability to cycle through and learn a lot about themselves and hopefully move through it in their lifetime. It doesn't come off to me like, this is where you need to be. There's a chaser. There's a runner. I, I just, again, I'm just talking a lot of shit because obviously I I have a problem with how people talk about it. Um, So I'm just using that as an example. <laughs> so I want to hear your thoughts and apologies if you actually believe in the concepts. <laughs> I personally don't, but I believe that anything is possible. Yes. My feeling with the concept though is why does it matter? Why do we need to put a label on a relationship and give it a weight or importance based off of, this is where language comes up again. I made this joke on my podcast in episode 20 called Karmic Relationships, Timeless Spirituality, go check it out, where, I mean, I ended up going on this little rant and it was like, well, why don't we not call them twin burners? Because it's something about twin flame. It just is like, yeah, it excites you. Whereas burner, it's like, what? You know, is this a stove? Like, is, you know, what, we're on the kettle together. So, it's that weight that's put behind that word or soulmates. I don't know. I maybe soulmates are real. I'm I'm open to the idea, mm -hmm. but I don't feel that it does any. I don't feel it's beneficial to put any label. Other than girlfriend boyfriend, wife, partner, and so on and so forth, just to establish what we are as opposed to, you know. Yeah, yeah. This is the universal consciousness. It's the play that's brought us together to save everything, not just Earth, but everything, everything, even the stuff we can't see and that we don't even know about because we are that important. Now, that may be a subset of people who are, believers in twin flames again that's where it's so important to talk about the terminology because i'm realizing right now i didn't even ask you what you think a twin flame is so i could be <laughs> talking about something completely different whereas for your definition i'll be like, oh yeah i totally believe in that <laughs> so <laughs> i probably not because i i didn't see the documentary but i listened to a podcast a mm -hmm. couple of years ago on that same group i'm like this is dangerous this is flat out dangerous yeah, yeah. and this is also where responsibility is a difficult thing when it comes to being a practitioner. Yeah. Because I have people coming in and talking about these things. And when they come in with that, I need to put my personal beliefs aside for the moment and, and not say what, you know, X, Y, or Z. So in a situation like that, where, because something that I've seen in, in twin flame culture, is, oh, this is your person. You just, you got to wait for them to become that person you know that they can be. So my question at that point is, what are you missing out on in the meantime while you're waiting? Not just my thoughts on this. It's just inquiry. It's a question. That's how Socrates pissed everyone off. It's just by asking a question. I mean no harm by asking that question. It's a legitimate question, and I say it. I think coming from a good place, I believe it's coming from a good place, is your life passing you by because you're waiting based off of a definition and someone telling you about a term and then you apply that term to a dynamic. Yeah. So that's, that's my feeling for it is language is just so important and why, why do you need to place that upon any given relationship? Can it just be Oh, I'm in a relationship or I was in a relationship. This is what they taught me. I I really miss them. Or I don't. If we come together, we come together. But don't let life pass you by. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, to your point, too, is I, I do believe that anything is possible. So I guess it's it's too much of a stretch to say, like, twin flames are not a thing. Because I do believe that anything's possible. I also believe in soulmates, but I don't just think of soulmates in the romantic sense. I also think of soulmates mm -hmm. as friends, family, et cetera. So yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I think that, you know, with everything in life, there's like 
I think there's like a truth and then human beings kind of interpret it their own way and kind of distort the truth or the true essence of the message. So there's Mm -hmm. probably something to twin flames that holds true, but I do think that the way it's being Mm. talked about could be very dangerous. And you're like, you said, what's the point of the title? Okay. So I want to kind of switch gears a little bit, not entirely. I want to kind of go into uh, this notion. I think, I think I heard you talk about it on another podcast that I was listening to you on and it was this idea of understanding people a little bit more so what do I mean by that so one thing I always thought about when I started getting into reincarnation and past lives right I was like there's so much hatred in the world there's so much discrimination there's so much prejudice and one thing that past life regression like woke me up to was this idea of oh my god this person that I have this um idea of or this prejudice towards I could literally be them in a different life right so I want to know and this might be a funny question to ask but do people stay the same race from lifetime to lifetime or do people have you regressed people who have been different races across different lifetimes from what I've seen, people switch. Mm, interesting. And that's, that's where it's like, got to be responsible. This is just what I've seen. I'm not going to tell you this is the way it is. But from the many, 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 many of these I've done as a practitioner and a participant, that's what I've seen is that we switch races and genders. Oh, I heard the gender part. Um, but I've I've never heard nobody has ever touched on the race part, which is really cool and I think could be scary for people to think about because it's like if you have a certain prejudice towards someone for their skin color or their culture or whatever, there's a possibility that you could be reincarnated into that culture or have that experience. So I think that there is something very potent about taking personal responsibility Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and if you are on the receiving end of something i think it's okay to call a spade a spade and then you know taking responsibility at the same time of lifting yourself out of that situation while being aware that this is one of the things that really bothers me with the manifestation culture when it comes from let's let's also just be very clear i am a white male who is talking about this right now, it's like, so I, I come from a position of, you know, I live in California. I, I really don't need to spell it out right now, right? It's, it's okay. You don't need that, to spell it out, yeah. One of the things that bothers me with manifestation culture is just, it, it's available to everyone. So anyone in any situation can lift themselves out of that situation. Okay, but is that taking everything into consideration? Because there are systemic issues that we have in every facet of our society. I'm not just talking about the United States. This is across the world. And while, while it may be someone's lesson to live a life of poverty, does that mean that I should just say that's their lesson? Let them live a life of poverty. Or can I stand up and say, you know what? I think we can do better. Because maybe that's the bigger part of it. Not just because I think that it's the lesson or whatever, but maybe I can put my feeling aside from whatever I may view the universe to be. Can't we just call a spade a spade and say, this is an issue, we need to fix it? And... With that, I also don't believe in altruism. I don't believe that Mm. any act is purely selfless. Even because I think on some level, let me just take this one step further. How do we know how the unconscious is operating? And then on an unconscious level, we're saying, okay, if we do this good thing, we're going to get points. I mean, this place that we can't see and we don't know. So someone may be doing something altruistically, consciously, but I still don't believe that any act is truly selfless. So when I look at those issues, 
it's a matter of again this i mean there's the conversation of time and is time linear that's that's a whole big thing i mean we can get into that yeah no we're gonna get into that i have i have some questions about that let's look at time in linear fashion right now though and as a white male right now on the west coast of the united states i was born into a life of privilege by the very nature of my skin color born into an upper middle class family which also gave me privilege that most people don't have and i can look at society and see there are groups that need help that yes while i believe in accountability and personal responsibility i have privileges that other people don't have but what if it's also about making it better for myself in another life because what if i was born into that situation so while I still believe in these good acts, I think it ultimately also comes around to if we want to be a little selfish about it, if I haven't been in their shoes before, maybe I will in another life. So wouldn't I want to do my, my all to make it the best that it can be, not only for them, but for myself as well? And I think that that's also where the level of self-awareness comes into play is it's okay to look at yourself in that, I want to say critical fashion, but impartially observing your actions and say, why am I doing this? And it, I, I don't really have a lot of shame in saying, yeah, I believe in reincarnation. If I was born into that situation, I would want it to be better. Yeah. So maybe I am doing it for me too. But I think it's okay because I think that if I was sitting here saying right now, oh no, it's purely just because I'm a fucking angel. <laughs> I'm a I'm a fucking light worker and I'm here to help everyone. This is what I'm here to do. <laughs> here to make the world a better motherfucking place. Sorry, I gotta use the rule of three. <laughs> so, sure, I'd like to help everyone, but let's call a spade a spade too. I do like my frozen yogurt at the end of the day, and that that is not a pun or metaphor or anything i just like frozen yogurt i like you know i, I want to live a sweeter life yeah in every yeah. incarnation a hundred percent oh Did my I god ask question perfectly okay. you know it's so funny a lot of people that i've talked to on the podcast i always find myself asking a particular question because we get to this juncture of you know it's it's important to make sure that we're not living a life feeling victimized all the time mm -hmm. and to some extent I agree with that because I do think the more you feel empowered and the more you're able to kind of do things and and not stay in this bubble of well everyone's against me and that's why my life is so horrible so I do think that there's truth to that but then I get to a juncture where I'm like okay but how do we hold people accountable because there's also this notion of everything happens for a reason we're all playing a specific role. And if someone is sick, they chose that to learn something. If someone is is dying, if, if someone is going through hardship, they chose that to learn something. And while that might potentially be true, how do we hold compassion and empathy? And, and if we are able to help people just make the world better, right? Because we make change in this world when people stand up to power right and we are able to make the world sweeter a little by little when we're actually like holding people accountable and holding ourselves accountable so sometimes I get nervous about this idea of like well everything is supposed to happen like people are suffering because they wanted to suffer but that just makes me not want to do anything I'm like oh well if you're supposed to suffer then okay well then I'll just let you suffer but imagine if Maybe that's just how my brain works, but I just imagine if everyone thought, oh, well, this person is poor because they chose that for themselves. So they don't have the right access to education because they chose that for themselves. I don't, I have the power to give them better education, but maybe that's, I'm I'm stepping in where I shouldn't step in. Does that make sense? Well, it's um, really easy to do that from an ivory tower. <laughs> Can you, I mean, was there, I, I'm ready to go off on that one. Yeah, please go ahead. So, I Yeah, that's why I brought it up, because I, I think you're the first person that I'm talking to that's actually kind of answering that question that I have. I would, I would challenge that person and say, what are you afraid of? Mm -hmm. 
What are you afraid of? What are you not looking at? What is it inside of yourself that you're afraid to look at? Straight up. That's what I would ask them. Because, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go Sorry? Ahead. No, I was going to say, is that what people consider spiritual bypassing or just pretending that, oh, they're ascending to a certain level so they don't have to deal with certain worldly dynamics? I think that could be a component of it. Mm -hmm. So I am a, I would, I would like to say recovering spiritual bypasser, but I'm sure I still have elements of it. I took a class back in 2017 called Contemplation and Inquiry. And when we got to the lesson on spiritual bypassing, I'm sorry, it wasn't spiritual bypassing, it was shadow work. Mm. And we were going around the circle, and it got to me, and we were, I can't remember, we were talking about the shadows or something like that. And I straight up said, I don't need to look at that. I know my purpose. I know why I'm here. Looking at that will just take me away from my path and my purpose. I'm here to help the world. That shit actually came out of my mouth. <laughs> I actually said that. Mm. It's because I was afraid to look at those things. I was afraid to look at those issues because I took on this view of all those things that happened to me happened to me for a reason. They made me into who I am, this dynamic person. <laughs> you throw some other <laughs> adjectives in there. I was here to do amazing things for the world. And those events shaped me. It all happened for a reason. Every one of those things. And without those things, I wouldn't be who I am. I was just afraid. I was afraid to look at those things. Straight up, I was yeah. afraid. It was easier for me to pass the buck and say, that was just the way it was supposed to be. The truth is, I may have felt a sense of purpose at the time. I was a fucking mess on the inside. My internal world was in such a state of disarray of, you know, the purpose, purpose, purpose. I know you guys can't see me right now. My hands are going like all over the place. <laughs> Doing horizontal jazz hands. But like, <laughs> purpose, 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 purpose. All about that. Walking down the street like purpose. Purpose, purpose, at the grocery store. Purpose, 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 purpose. I'm here to do this. What? 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 The absurdity of that. What? And it was about. Well, let me just also, I want to give you credit right now, because before coming on, I listened to, you know, I think I told you I listened to the episode that had to do with the giants, and you guys talked about mechanisms of control, also that you know, of like coming from a shadowy place. And just, I said before, I believe anything is possible. Mm -hmm. So while I'm like, I don't know if there are people sitting in a room, you know, conspiring to control everything, it's possible. But you won me over when you talked about the mechanisms of fear and how if there is this thing, maybe that's a part of it. Maybe this is part of one of the mechanisms of control is putting it out there. This is, or there's this, you know, controlling thing out there because it's going to scare the shit out of you. It's going to make you feel like you have no control over your life. Yeah. You're going to dedicate your life and like, rah, 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 this, we got to take it down, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> What's it taking you away from, though? Mm. I mean, that was rhetorical in my mind. <laughs> so I'm talking to myself, but it's, <laughs> it's taking you away from what's going wrong in my life. Yeah, because if everyone else is the problem, then I don't need to look at what's going on with me. But look at economics. You have micro and you have macro. Mm -hmm. Micro being the small component and macro being the bigger picture. And while a lot of the warriors out there, I'll put that even in quotes, are so focused on the macro, I think they're blind to see that the real shifts Happen at the micro. Because if you can shift the micro, then you move the mass to the macro. Mm -hmm. So what if you're looking too big? So yeah, I can look at the world and say, yeah, I think that there are all these mechanisms of control in place. But you know what? I don't have the ability to take it down. But if they do feed off of my fear, well, let's cut that motherfucker off. 
Mm. Work on what it is that I'm afraid of. So they can't feed off me. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I may still be a cog in the system, but if there is an energetic feeding taking place, I don't want to scare anyone right now, whatever that thing may be, well, then cut it off. Because if I'm alleviating that emotion that I'm carrying around, then, well, you're going to starve them. Mm -hmm. And the more people who cut that off by working on it and looking at it and releasing it, then you're going to starve whatever that thing is. So that's, yeah, that was my long-winded way of saying, I think it's easier to say that's all part of the purpose. So yeah, I, I think that there is some big plan at play, but I also believe in free will. And I also realize that I'm human and I'd be a fool to think that I'd understand the complexities of everything at play and be like, I got this figured out. It's all part of the plan, but nothing could be adjusted. No, that'd be stupid and foolish of me. Yeah. And it's like, you know, we're talking about the systemic issues. There have been systemic issues in the United States for hundreds of years. It may be uncomfortable to look at that and say, you know what? Sure. We may have said separate but equal and that that's been a thing of the past. What is it really fully a thing of the past? Yes, we have progressed in many ways as a society in a linear time sense. But there are still issues that go back in linear time that need to be addressed. And sure, while there's responsibility and while there are exceptions to the rule, well, there's always going to be an exception to the rule. Does that mean that, oh, well, that person did it, so you should be able to? No, we don't know the circumstances of everyone else. Mm -hmm. It's too easy to just say, well, that person, I don't need to look at anyone else's circumstances or take them into consideration. So that's that's the again, my long-winded way of saying it's, what are you afraid of? Mm -hmm. Why is it easier for you to say that's all part of the plan instead of saying, you know what? Maybe it is, but maybe there's more to it. Maybe we should do something about it. Maybe we should help everyone for our future, whatever that future may be. And if you want to be like me and look at it through a selfish lens, because I don't want to be in those circumstances in another incarnation. Yeah. Yeah. It, maybe, maybe that's part of, of my progress is to call a spade a spade on an emotional level be like, yeah, that's my motivation. I am being selfish. I'm not going to sit up here right now and just say, oh yeah, I'm King Altruist. <laughs> well, you're not being selfish because I, I think a lot of people, it's kind of similar to the same term where people are like, well, I don't want to do that because I don't want that karma coming back to me, right? So they decide to let something go or they decide not to seek out revenge or whatever. I do think that when you do this work, you're kind of getting a cheat code. If that was reality of us reincarnating and having different experiences, then you're potentially getting a cheat code to avoid difficult lives. You know what I mean? Um, I, I got to jump in again, though. Yeah, let's, go ahead. Can we, sorry, let's talk about that word revenge. Now, what you and I may view as, as revenge, someone else may view as them standing up for themselves. Mm. Or what if it's vice versa? What if what they view as revenge is what we view as someone standing up for themselves? Interesting. So even in that situation, maybe letting it go isn't the best thing. Mm. But then again, maybe it is. Because maybe you were someone like, I'm not going to let anyone walk all over me. So maybe the lesson is to be a little more passive. But what? So that's where I think it's like, foolish yeah. to operate from a... And I, I'm not saying... I know that you, know, you weren't saying like, this is what I do. But yeah. it's just <laughs> that you know the rule set because you don't. You don't know the rules. So because maybe it's it's easier to say I'm I'm gonna let this go instead of standing up for myself. Because oh. it's scary to stand up for myself. So maybe you're repeating the pattern by doing that. Because mm -hmm. I personally don't view it as revenge to say, that was wrong what you did to me. I'm not gonna hurt you, but that was wrong. Right. Now, what do you do with that? I mean, that's that's the question. Mm -hmm. but you know do we know the rule set do we know the we rules don't know. of how this works we don't know and I think that's why it's fascinating and I think to your point about the revenge thing I, you're right I think everybody has a different definition of what 
potentially they can consider revenge. I consider revenge if I kicked you and I said sorry and you say, okay, Jimmy, you're you're good. I accept your apology. But then like you come up with a diabolical plan to make sure I fall off a building because you're still pissed off that I kicked okay, you. Well, that's a step too far. <laughs> but <laughs> that I think, you know, I, I would consider that to be revenge. But I I I I get what you're saying. That's and just I a think psychopath. I think a lot Sorry. of people who go down re like rabbit holes for revenge, a lot of times, I'm not a mental health like specialist, but it, it does, they do give psychopathic tendencies because they, I people, I feel like people who do, uh, they're vengeful. They take it too far. That's the whole point of revenge. You have to take it a step further. So the person doesn't do it again. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what I think. Um, I think also to add to your point, and I think in, in what you're saying is that there's also an element where, yeah, we can ha talk about all of these metaphysical concepts, but we have to live in this physical reality. Like mm -hmm. there's that's a better way of putting it. <laughs> I think you said it well. I think you did a great job explaining that as well. But I think we have to live in this physical reality and not just be in the clouds, like thinking of this like altruistic place or existence that we're not currently in so there needs to be a fine line between understanding those concepts and having those conversations and trying to implement them in your life in a positive way so you can have a positive impact on people but you also have to live this physical existence and it's like to your point about the micro versus the macro it it starts with it starts with self and self-accountability mm -hmm. and then trying to be the best version of yourself when you are interacting with other people. Um, Cause to your point, I just think a lot of times when I listen to conversations and people are talking about, oh, well, there's an earthquake coming soon and earth is going to be wiped out and we're, we're shifting into a new earth and uh, billions of people are going to like something crazy is going to happen. We don't know if that's true or not, but I think that if, if people who are doing this work want to elevate consciousness, I think to your point about personal responsibility, it's not like don't talk about the truth, but you also have to add a, a, a feeling of hope to it, a feeling of agency, a feeling of I can kind of, in a way, control my life and dictate my path. And I don't have to be stuck in a specific experience or I can help people if I want to, if that makes any sense. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Well, yeah, I've done some very low vibe things in the course of this conversation. <laughs> you know, like what? Well, you know, I've I've said some four letter words. I've uh, I've well, shown I some signs of, of aggression. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these very low vibe things. I but did too. <laughs> it's like one of the ways that I tricked myself after my first regression was. I felt all of my anger alleviated after that. And I think that there was something real that transpired there. Let me, let me back up a little bit. One of the things I like to tell people when it comes to past life regression is imagine that you have a hill to walk up or even a mountain. And you're walking up that mountain with a backpack full of rocks. But what we can do is we can empty that backpack for you. But you still got to walk up that mountain. And on the walk up, your backpack has the potential to be filled up with more rocks. So it's up to you to keep those rocks out of that backpack. So with the anger, I, I feel like my backpack was emptied after my first regression. Mm -hmm. And I think I convinced myself that I was better off without it. And I, this is, I literally did this. I was like, oh yeah, anger is in a part of my life. So things would come up and I took pride in not having an emotional reaction to it. Even though I would never really show it on the outside, but even on the inside, eh, whatever. Eh. I'm, I'm better than that now. No, I'm, I'm better. I'm evolved. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then coming to the realization, and as we're recording this now, it was this February of 2024. A little over a year ago, coming to the realization that no, it, it never went away. You just suppressed it. Mm -hmm. That bag may have been emptied, but there have been things that have happened over the last decade that have pissed me off and that I just suppressed. 
So oh, what a fool I was thinking I was better off without it. Mm. And I mean, it's it's a matter of, well, what do you do with that? But anger is a normal human emotion. Yeah. And sure, the high vibe people may, well, he's just trying to take everyone over the dark side now, you know, not be in the light by saying you need your anger. It's like, what are you pissed off about? <laughs> what are you not looking at and addressing? Yeah. And realizing that the the perfect medium was a balance, was addressing what would upset me by acknowledging that it was there and not taking pride in like, I'm pissed off anger now. Better than that. No, that was what was stupid, was to think that I wasn't going to have this normal human emotion. Yeah. So how did that come up again? I forgot. Oh, oh, because I, about me being low vibe. And yeah, so it's like, you know, you bring up the shift to another earth or another earth, you know, the new earth, whatever that may be. Look, while I believe in the concept to a certain extent, I also, in, I believe it's just a new way of looking at the world. While, yes, there was a time when I would wake up in the morning and want to look outside and you know, open the blind and be like, is the sky gold yet? You know, are we singing in the circle of life with all of the animals singing kumbaya together? Is that, is that happening yet? Oh, no, it's just a Tuesday. It, it was because it was easier for me to think that that was what was going to happen as opposed to, oh, you got some anger you need to look at. You got some emotions. You had a bad day yesterday. It's okay. You're human. And... Yeah. And I think it's it's the acknowledgement of that. And you know, yeah. like it's I got really caught up in all of the metaphysical stuff because it was easier than yeah. going well and here was the thing is I was going to therapy at the time, but I was talking about this stuff, which really didn't do me any good. And it's like on my podcast coming up right now. I mean, I don't know when this episode's gonna air, but mm-hmm. I'm starting a new season right now where the question I ask is, what is home? In the very first episode, I ask what I deem to be a rhetorical question, which is, where is more growth going to take place? From having a conversation about aliens or having a conversation about what is home? Because we may view home as four walls and a roof, but what if home is so much more than that? And while that's not fun to talk about that, Imagine the growth that can come from a conversation like that because you never know how someone's going to view home. Yeah. And that's what I, and, but here's the other thing too. I think it's okay to have conversations about aliens and cool things. Yeah. Because sometimes you got to get away from the super serious stuff. Sometimes it's okay to kick your feet up and watch a comedy. It's okay. It's okay to be human. It doesn't need to be like, well, is this taking away from my purpose? And you know, I'm, I'm being low vibe because I'm laughing at, at this joke. Be human. Get your head out of your ass. Like, seriously. Yeah. I, I think we have to be grounded. I think that there is this, as human beings, we are just wired a certain way. There's a reason why we have emotions. And I even think in the spiritual community, people talk a lot about moving away from the ego. But I think that there's a the more spiritual you are, I think there's like a spiritual ego that people develop, right? Where maybe unintentionally, it's not like they're trying to be condescending towards other people who haven't achieved a certain level of uh, enlightenment, but that does come with it sometimes. And I do think that sometimes. part of the, yeah, <laughs> a lot of times, um, I think part of the reason why I'm so curious about these concepts and I'm so into them is because for me on my personal journey, it's really helped, you know, affirm who I am as a person and also Mm -hmm. allow me to develop a lot of compassion and empathy and also not take life too seriously because I'm like if we don't know what's going on and Mm -hmm. if these are all the different possibilities then like oh this potentially could be a game Mm -hmm. um so yeah I agree with everything that you're saying I think it's important to still kind of remain grounded and have our feet planted in the ground even though we're still having these conversations I think Mm -hmm. there's there's a need for both in this human exactly. existence. Um, so I agree with you. And I think you brought up the concept of time. And I really want to talk about that. I know we've had such an amazing conversation, but I, I, 
I would be so mad at myself if we didn't get to touch on time, especially with the work that you do. Because that's another part that's very fascinating to me. Do you mind if I, I, I want to dive in there. Mind if I say one thing on the last yeah. thing really quick? Yes, yes. So all of this is also coming from someone right now whose life is all about these conversations. I'm very fortunate that I get to have these conversations all day. I talk about past lives and reincarnation every day. Ugh, so I mean. it's like, while being aware that that's the, you know, the ivory tower that I'm sitting in, I'm so fortunate that this is my job, that I get to talk about these things. So I understand the desire to talk about these things and how alone I felt before I could openly talk about these things. Like none of that is lost on me. And I, I just, I remember those days when I would give anything to be able to sit down and have this conversation that we're having right now and just feeling that turmoil inside because it wasn't available to me. So I, I just hope that that comes across right now so that I'm really not telling anyone you shouldn't have these conversations if you're not, you know, it's, it's just no, find a balance. It's yeah. okay. And, you know, when it comes to even if you are on your spiritual path, you don't necessarily need to leave your friends behind. You know, like there would be times back in the day when I sitting with my friends that I'd been friends with for years, like, be like, why can't you guys talk about something that I deem to be of substance? And then be at this point now where it's like, oh, good. This isn't a conversation of what I would deem to be substance. I get a break from what I talk about all the time. Like, I don't need to leave <laughs> those people behind because I'm shifting, but they're also accepting of me. Yeah. So it's like, you know, that's that's the other thing is I think in this it's a ball about, well, you got to leave those low vibe people behind, you know, that aren't on. It's like, do you, do you really? So ultimately it's just, I really want to say it's okay to talk about these things. I'm, I'm coming from a place of privilege with that too, that I'm fortunate enough to talk about those things. So let's do time now. What you got? Yeah. It's, we're going to do time. I just want to add to something that you said. Um, <laughs> Cause I agree with you. And, and I don't think you were coming across like, Oh, don't have these conversations. It's just like a caution to be grounded. But mm -hmm. to your point about Gotta open um, up the door somehow. Yes. Yeah. These conversations I crave, I have a whole freaking podcast called shifting dimensions on it. So I crave these conversations. I'm, I want this to be a job for me where I can you're just have in, these you're conversations. Needed voice though. That's like a very it, needed voice. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So this is, this fuels me. I, I have, I get so much soul nourishment from talking to people like you and connecting with people like you, but you know, I used to be to, to your point too, I used to be really like, not sad, but just unfulfilled in certain conversations with family and friends, because I want to go towards the deep end. And they're like, girl, you're weird. Uh, <laughs> like you're, you're doing too much. And I just used to feel like, oh, I, I just, really wish I had this outlet. And I'm realizing that this is my outlet. I don't have to talk about these conversations with my friends and family. We could talk about Love is Blind, you know, the new season. Mm -hmm. And that is also really fun because it, you know, it keeps careful, me grounded. It sounds low vibe. <laughs> oh, trust me. Uh, if I, Listen, but you know what it is? I'm like, if I went on that show, I, I wonder how people I, I would come across. Like, I like to think I'm a sane, nice person, but I, I'm always like, people are so mean to those people on those shows. I'm like, they're just human beings, very flawed human beings, but so are the rest of us watching it. So it's, it's, it's oh, fun. I am. Oh. <laughs> um, but yes, let's switch over and talk about time. So in your work, how did you see time? How did you think of time before? Right. Cause you're really into science and all of that stuff how did you see time before and did your perspective change once you started doing past life regressions i saw time as 24 hours in a day plain and simple i saw it in a forward moving direction mm -hmm. you couldn't go backwards wow okay my favorite movie was back to the future but the notion of traveling back in time was absolutely absurd to me mm. so i dreamed of it but the seconds went on and so did the day that's the only way I could perceive time. How did I perceive it when I started regression, doing regressions? It was, I tried to fit it in the box of linear time. I really tried my hardest. And with that, I'll give you an example from one of my earlier sessions. There was a girl that I did a session with who was born 
I believe in the in the late 80s. And she saw herself. Again, this this is when I started. So I was more focused at the time on place and time and date and those things and spending the time to get that information. Like, where are you? What year is it? Because, you know, that, that was what was sexy. <laughs> Before I realized, like, oh, it's about the, the healing and growth. That's what's really important. I don't know why I said that in a sarcastic voice. But seriously, that's what's important. But I was much more focused on that at the time. And she saw herself as a man who crashed on a desert island or something like that in a plane. Mm -hmm. And this was in the 80s. And I kept saying to myself, or just waiting for for him to die on that island. Like, it's coming soon. It's coming. It's coming. Then imagine my surprise when he was rescued. I'm oh, like, wow. okay, is the boat going to sink? <laughs> like, what's going to happen? Is he going to get shot once he gets to land? When is the death coming? Didn't come. He made it back. He made it to the 90s. He made it to his daughter's wedding in the year 2000 or something like that. And I'm sitting there saying, what the hell is going on here? How? Like, how? 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 So I did my best to rationalize it in my mind after the fact, which was, you know what? There are some possibilities. One, this is a, you know, as we were talking about at the very beginning, with drawing upon something, was it necessarily this person's life? No. So maybe it was just drawing from the collective consciousness for something that was tangible. And for this person at the time, it, it made sense because it was like, you know, there was issues with the relationship and they felt like they crashed on a desert island. But then that person was able to be rescued and find, find a life once they got back to the shore. So it was if it was metaphorically speaking, it was like, even though this is where you feel like you are right now, there's hope. Mm. You're going to be able to go to these amazing things later on. And the wedding, all of these things. Mm. And I'm sitting there saying, okay, well, it's crazy that this is the only tangible thing that whatever's intelligent out there could find to give to this girl who was in her 30s, right? Oh, no, not, I'm sorry, late 20s. Sorry. It's funny, I get the times mixed up now and time's my thing. So that's one possibility. You are drawing from the collective consciousness. Another one is a parallel existence, whatever that may mean, that a part of her oversoul split off into multiple lives and is living lives concurrently. Mm. That made it easy for me to picture it that way because it still fit in with the linear box. But as time, not time, has gone on, I've allowed for the possibility that time is not linear in that... It's not time per se. It's not so much a when as a where. Mm. And I'm still trying to wrap my head around that, but by viewing it as a when, I've been limiting myself in a linear sense. Because what if it's about like little little islands of time or something like that? Like if you're mm. viewing it from a different vantage point and it's just places. It could be, I don't know. But think of the day. Think of my favorite book in the world. It's called The Timekeeper. And the basis of it is the guy who was responsible for not necessarily the creation of time, but also the creation of time because he was the first person to track time. So with a day, we, we measure a day by 24 hours. We also measure it by the, the, the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun. But what happened before we attached terms and words to it, like twin flames and stuff like that? <laughs> Things existed before. I mean, completely unrelated. But when we strap this concept on the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun, the sun, and, you know, it rose and set before we called it a day, but that's the only constant there is the rising and setting of the sun. We as humans created day. We created the tracking of that time through 
This is one when it rises and sets. This is another one when it rises and sets. This is another one when it rises and sets. Because we have the opportunity to say seven rise and sets equals one. Yeah. I don't know why I did it in that voice, but it sounded, you know, much more ancient. We created that concept. But what if, and it's, again, this is where it gets into, I am a human. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, but what if? What if there are so many more mechanics going on at play here with the universe that when these terms were applied to these markers of what we now deem to be time, that there was a creation of time that took place there. And by our collective agreement to mark these markers as time, that we created something entirely. Mm. Because to me, the only constant before that was the rising and setting of the sun. That happened. Or did it? I personally think it did. But it's like, what if you're dropped on this playground? I'm not saying like in an Adam and Eve sense. But what if it's just a, like, and that's the other thing to get into, you know, if this is a simulation or not. Mm -hmm. What if it is, but we just can't comprehend what the hell that means? Because when we think simulation, I think everyone's thinking, oh, well, yeah, we got the Sims. That's what it means. We have no free will. You know, everything is planned. Like, this is a simulation. We got to break free of the matrix. All right, bird brain human. Do you know what the hell you're talking about? <laughs> or are you only human? Is that all you can comprehend? Because that's the terminology that we placed on simulation. But what if that is what if that is only because in the last four decades or so, we have understood what simulation is because of the introduction of virtual reality, you know, in the 80s and 90s. And so once we had the terminology for it, we then applied it to this grander thing. But what if what happens when that term evolves and it becomes something more, you know, something more than it is now? Is that, hmm, does that take away from what it is now? Not necessarily, but maybe it's all we can comprehend. So, yes, to answer your question, yes. I view time very different. I think that was the question. Like, I view yeah. time very yeah. differently now than I used to. And then even, <clears throat> in a regression, let me back that up. <clears throat> Sorry. Now, even in a regression, when someone goes back, and I'll give you an example taking someone back to a slave ship mm. when they were slave and they were a slave. I mean, really a slave. You want to talk about being a slave? That's slavery. You know, and I'm not, I, again, with this world right now in, in terminology needing to be very clear, there's the feeling of being a slave, and then there is really being a slave. And I'm talking, again, this, is, this goes beyond skin color. I just need to make that clear to everyone right now what I'm saying. It's like, until you're actually in those shoes, which I could say, yeah, I've been a slave, but that was another life, so I don't really know what it's like. Like, that was slavery. And all that that person wanted was to be free. So what do we do? We set them free. And not only them, but we set their family free. Mm. So in that space, it's like, all right, how are we going to do that? We're going to have you break everyone out of the shackles. And then there is a release that takes place there. And they come back feeling different. Now the question becomes, did they actually break free of those shackles? Or was this something happening on a subconscious level? Or something we don't understand? Because if they actually broke free, or broke free of those shackles, then maybe they've altered the trajectory of time as we know it. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the grandfather effect, the one where if you go back in time and kill your grandfather, can you be born? Which has the ramifications. Right. So are we messing with time when we go in there? I would hope not. Because I'm oh, just trying to do a good, good question. Thing. Oh, and but I maybe I can't comprehend it because I seem to have a memory of it being the same way, but maybe mm -hmm. not. But what if time is so much more complex than we can possibly comprehend? And that I think goes with the parallel dimensions and parallel realities. And where where does a splinter take place? Which is 
the one reality? And that's the question. Is there even one? Or is that only the way that we can comprehend it? Or is it something so much grander? So that's, that's the one thing I really want to leave everyone with is you don't know. When you think you know, you don't. That's it, straight up. It's the mm-hmm. difference between believing and knowing. I believe that time is not linear. I can't prove it yet. But can I prove that it's linear? It sure appears to be that way. But I don't know. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. And I think you just sparked my curiosity about the notion of when someone goes into their past life and they take a certain action, could that be changing time in in their reality and their different lives? I think everything's connected. I've heard that a lot of all of our lives are happening at the same time. And if you choose to take action, if I choose to take action in this life, it could potentially affect quote unquote, the future or past version of me, but everything's happening all at once. All timelines are in flow. But then, like you said, what's the truest timeline? It just, it's mind blowing. We know nothing to your point. We know nothing. Yes. Let's say you were to go grab a pile of rocks, Hmm. hold them in your hand and turn your hand the other way and drop them. Do you think that that's seemingly random where they land? I would, my human brain is like, yes, it's random. And I, I don't know the answer to that. Mm. But I think it's something as simple as that. Is, is it random? Or is there order and chaos? Or is that all we can comprehend? And it's something so much more than that. We can go down rabbit holes forever. I think we're just, I think we're getting to the point where we, we have a lot more questions than answers um <laughs> well it's like i can give you a good example for me too that class i was telling you about the contemplation and inquiry one mm-hmm. the way of it was pitched and appropriately so was the gateway to mysticism mm-hmm. i was so pissed when i'd be in that class and we'd be talking about language shadow work and spiritual bypassing in this ex- expression of some but not all what is this horse shit? This was pitched as the gateway to mysticism. What is this? I want it now. I want, I want the mysticism now. I really wish I stuck it out. I mm. really wish I took those lessons more seriously instead of wanting more and more and more and being like, this is stupid. And the irony is I'm someone who's like, you got to have a solid foundation for whatever you're going to start. Yeah. And when it came down, I'm like, I want it all right now. I don't need this stupid. I don't need to look at my shadows. I know my purpose. Give me the mysticism so I can do my purpose. Yeah. I got this. That was the gateway to mysticism, whatever that was. It's sitting there and, and differentiating the difference between believing and knowing. That was the first lesson in that class. That was from my, yeah, like I said, it was my astrology teacher, but it was in a different class. And I'm like, yeah. all right, got this really cool thing with the astrology. Got more than I bargained for there, too. But <laughs> it's like gateway to mysticism. Yeah. Differently, yeah. Although I'm like, okay, that's cool. I like that concept. But, but then some, but not all. That made so much sense to me because I realized there are so many things in my life that I'm treating as totality and absolutes mm-hmm. when it's not. It's like this always happens. Does it or does it happen sometimes? Mm. Is it, are they point. all like this or are some of them like that? And just looking at a term like some but not all had such an impact on my life. Mm. You know, and that's, that's why good. it's like, yeah, these rabbit holes are so much fun. But it's like, what do we do with that information at the end yeah. of the day? Yeah, like that's that's where it comes down to it, and and I wasn't excited enough about some, but not all. Yeah, and mm. but to me, that's like I don't know if you're familiar with astrology, but uh, I, just like the basics, I need to do a deeper dive. So I I have four placements of Taurus in my chart, mm. and an expression for Taurus is slow and steady wins the race. Oh, and mm. maybe that's my my path 
maybe mm-hmm. these things that I'm reaching irresponsibly right now are just for me and not anyone else. Maybe everyone else's thing is to go out there and find your twin flame and go down rabbit holes and 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 block all of your friends and family who don't see the world the way you do. And, you know, go out there and tell everyone I'm better than you because I'm spiritual. I don't need to look at that stuff. I'm better than you are. Maybe, maybe that's the right thing to do. So maybe I need to sit, look with that and be like, wow, you're being really irresponsible, pushing mm-hmm. your beliefs on everyone out there saying, take your yeah. time, everyone. I mean, I think I'm being responsible, but then do I know it or do I believe it? No, mm-hmm. I believe it. I don't know it. Mm-hmm. Oh, is my heart in the right place? I believe it is. I believe I'm trying to do the right thing. Is that what matters at the end of the day? I hope so. Hope that right. it believes or that that my intentions matter. Mm-hmm. And I mean, these are these are the things that I think are just so important for us mm-hmm. to take the time to look and really take into consideration. And, what is this? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you know I mean? just yeah, that that's it. Yeah, I was just gonna ask, like, what is the sum but not all concept? I think it I have an intuitive understanding, but I just want to know at a high level what that means. Well, let's let's even look at the twin flame thing. Mm-hmm. We may have a perception of what someone who believes in that concept is, mm. and some of them, but not all of them. I mean, I I I think that that's oh okay. They you know appropriate way to apply that term. I could be wrong, but I think it's looking at those situations just like someone who you know like. In the states right now, I'm not gonna. Well, it'll be very clear what I'm talking about. It's like people who support a certain candidate are all racist. Well, maybe some of them are, but not all of them. And then on the flip side of it, all people on that side are, you know, it rhymes with ominous. Maybe some of them are, but not all of them. Got it. Yeah, I think, but when yeah. you look at that, there's something that's so settling in a weird way about it's not all of it because yes. you got to look at it deeper. You can't lump everything together and say it's everything. It's like, yes, people are more complex than that. Situations are more complex than that. Sometimes, I that. yeah, not all you know, it's yeah, and but looking at that statement on its own, it's like, holy shit, is that deep. It's yeah, it's three deep. words that are so insignificant on their own. Oh, no, I'm sorry, four words. Yes, four words. Four yeah. words, yeah. <laughs> Which changes things. Yeah. <laughs> Some, but not all. Not all. all. Yeah. You know, very, very insignificant words on their own. But know, together, it, they pack a punch. Right? Yeah. And, which really makes you think. I think a lot of the world's a lot of concepts, a lot of things are gray. There's a lot of nuance. And Mm -hmm. I come across a lot of people where it's like, no, it's black or white. Facts are facts. These are the facts. You can't deny them. You can't argue this. This is da 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 da. And a lot of people, I mean, they, they, they are, they are right to feel that way about certain things, but I'm, I'm, I agree with wholeheartedly with everything that you said. I think a lot of times it's some, but not all, you know, um, Well, I always like to end off with a fun question. So this is because this is called Shifting Dimensions. I want to know, have you shifted in perspective on anything lately? It could be you used to hate chocolate ice cream. Now you love it. Or it could be as deep as you want it to be. While I am not religious myself, I have been shifting my views on religion. And really really taking to heart that religions in and of themselves are not evil. People are. I'm not pointing a finger at any given religion right now. It's people are. But again, then people are also more complex than just a simple term. But just because a person uses religion in the name of something, it's not the religion's fault necessarily. And do we fully know the origins of religions and, and where the ideas come from? No. Maybe we think we do. Maybe things were changed along the way by people. So I think that that's what I've been shifting on is that 
a religion in and of itself is not a person, even though I think I've, I've viewed religion as people. And when I would hear any of those given religions, it was like it would take on the, the appearance of a person, and I would give it those characteristics. I mean, it was personification. Mm. Just, I personified relate, or sorry, I personified religions, and I've I've shifted on that and just been like, people, it's not the religion. I love that so much. I love that so much. Thank you so much, Daniel. Where can Thank people you find me. you? I it was a pleasure. Where can people find you if they want to learn more about you or work with you or check out your podcast? It's okay to plug the podcast. Yes, it is. <laughs> I probably should have asked for permission to do that before. But... You like done it like four or five times. Already. <laughs> do I need to do it again? I probably should, right? Yeah, you should do it again. Just get in every once. Timeless spirituality. Timeless spirituality. Check it out. Timeless spirituality. So that's my podcast. It's Timeless mm -hmm. Spirituality, and my website is thepastliferegressionist.com. And you can also reach me on Instagram at thepastliferegressionist.com. So just this was. Thank you. Thank you for having me on today. This was a fun one. Again, I I know I said it earlier, but I just really want to stress to your audience. That while I am not the arbiter of what's needed in the world, I personally believe that you are a needed voice. Where we stand today, recording this go in that linear time sense of February of 2024, you got a good head on your shoulders right now. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. That's <laughs> up to you. So please don't use this as an endorsement for the future. <laughs> it's just where we are right now, because you made that mistake before. But as of now in this conversation, and something tells me that you're just still going to have a good head on your shoulders, but I do believe that you're a needed voice. So I appreciate the rabbit holes you go down from a grounded perspective and how it's like, yeah, we can look at this, but what about this? I think that that's really cool. So I just, I hope that your audience really, they probably already feel it, but hopefully saying this will make it more tangible for them so they can understand what they're feeling if they don't already because i think sometimes it's hard to put you no know, words to our feelings and thoughts yeah so i i just i appreciate you having this platform to go to these places because i i do believe that you are needed a voice so just keep doing what you're doing and if you change your view on twin flames that's okay that's okay. That's your choice. Yes. You have free will. Or or maybe that was all part of the design is for you to <laughs> to then become this huge advocate of it and, and lead the cult cause. Yeah. <laughs> that's so funny. So oh, that's... Get some some but not all. <laughs> cult, as, I now get, as I get canceled by that community now. <laughs> it's no. some some but not all. I that I really I think that's the last thing yeah. I want to stress to everyone. It's some but not all. Mm. Sometimes it's the bad apples that give the good ones a bad name. Yeah, you're right. And and sometimes people are just on their journeys and they mean no harm. So, yeah. You know, and and what the hell do we know? Anyways, we could be so wrong with the things that we're saying right now. We could be you know, we we could be the fools. We could have this thing so ass backwards. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate you so much, Daniel. Um appreciate your kind words and you also shifted my perspective. I I do believe that the world has a lot of nuance, but the some but not all is going to make me reflect on certain things that I have a hard line like drawn across. Um, so I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you.